Welcome back everyone. This is the rise of an Atlantic world. The second of our lectures this week. It will be presented like the pre-Columbian America lecture in two parts. That is to make it a bit easier for you to uh, to sit down when you have a chance and watch for oh usually 20-25 minutes or so the first half of a lecture and then come back uh, to watch the second half. So the rise of an Atlantic world, part of our f first serious look into the content of early American history. From a modern vegetable stand in Naples, Italy, we see Italian foods that history tells us come not from Italy, uh, but from Native America. suggesting evidence of a historical relationship between the Western and Eastern hemispheres, between the Americas and Europe, a historical relationship framed by the Atlantic Ocean. If we take a global view here of events at the time of contact between the Americas uh, and Europe, we see that Europeans in effect, we're simply extending a process of empire building now into a new direction. That is, the states of Asia and Europe and even North Africa, which had been established through conquest, expansion, and political domination, whether it be the Ottoman Empire here of the Turks, or the Safavid or Mughal Empire of India, or the great Chinese dynasties perhaps even the Mongolian uh, Empire of the 13th century, that these represent in effect patterns of expansion, in some cases conquest and domination by powerful political states. Europe, as you see it here, will extend that process, that is the states of Europe will extend that process by the 1400s and 1500s in a western direction uh, to the Atlantic Ocean and the regions of what we call the Atlantic world. So Eurasian and North African empires as they appeared on the eve of European conquest establishing a precedent if you will for empires to come. Empowered by growing wealth and connection to the markets of Asia the merchants, traders, bankers and adventurers of Europe were ready now for a global presence, a global posture by the 1400s with growing wealth based on trade in the Mediterranean uh, and growing contacts with the merchants and traders of the Middle East. The rising class uh, urban class of Western Europe, of cities like Venice, Italy, and Genoa, Italy, and elsewhere, uh, able to finance voyages of commerce and trade, uh, begin setting their sights on a larger field of commerce and enterprise, one that would come to include connections with the Far Eastern markets of East Asia, looking for trade routes, as we know, ultimately led one of them, a merchant shipper by the name of Cristoforo Colon, to risk travel across what to Europeans was an unknown territory, an, un an unknown field of travel, the Atlantic Ocean, where he hoped to find connection with the, the markets of the Far East, with what Europeans called the Indies, which included Japan and China, Southeast Asia, and of course India. So emboldened to look for new routes and opportunities to develop markets and trade, European states embarked upon their own voyages of exploration and, and discovery. Portugal in particular, located on the far western end of the Eurasian continent, the Iberian Peninsula, a, a country completely bounded by the Atlantic Ocean, became a leading power in the European expansion of the oceans, 
the Discoveries Monument, which you see to the left here, it stands towering today in Lisbon, Portugal, as a monument to the great adventurers, explorers, seafarers who led the Portuguese expansion. Sticking into the tip of the Atlantic Ocean like a finger is Sagres, Portugal, which became the Portuguese equivalent of Silicon Valley, that is, the place where innovation, cutting-edge technology, map-making, ship construction, etc., all of which was enriched by the traditions of the Arabs, the North Africans, and others who sailed the Mediterranean Sea, and who came to Portugal at the behest of the Portuguese prince Henry, uh, the leader of the Portuguese maritime expedition effort, Henry brought to Portugal the best minds and, and brightest minds and talent of the day, Jews, Arabs, North Africans, uh, as well as Christian Europeans, uh, to uh, create a kind of brains trust of, of exploration that would enable a, a rather uh, underpowered country. Uh, Portugal was a, a relatively small, relatively poor country, but one with enormous ambitions to take on the great effort of maritime exploration. Check out this website if you'd like to see more about Portuguese history and particularly the efforts of Henry and the Portuguese mariners. The Portuguese were certainly uh, enticed and encouraged to risk life and limb on what for them was a, uh, a voyage of, of the unknown, uh, that is the near Atlantic Ocean ships uh, known as caravels uh, because of their design uh, typically large cargo containers uh, to the, the, uh, the stern that is the rear of the ship fronted by a pointed prow uh, with several sailing masts including swiveled uh, central masts that could be uh, used to capture wind from different directions. All of this sort of ship design, caravel ship design, again inspired by centuries of seafaring among Arabs, Persians, uh, and peoples of the Indian Ocean, uh, who now Europeans had uh, made contact with in their voyages through the Eastern Mediterranean. Enabled by navigation tools from China and the Middle East, like the magnetic compass, a Chinese invention, the first person recorded to have used the compass as a navigational aid was the legendary seafarer Zhang Hu, who came from the Yunnan province of southern China. He made seven voyages between 1405 and 1433. Notice these dates. This is 60 years before Columbus. And Zhang Hu had led the famous Chinese treasure fleets from China to the west, reaching as far as the Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of Africa. The object of the voyages was to display the glory and might of the Chinese Ming Dynasty. Uh, but they also proved, ultimately, to other nations and states that long-distance ocean navigation, maritime travel, was not only possible, but potentially quite probable, profitable. Excuse me. And in, uh, in, in sort of encountering the navigational technologies, like the compass, like the uh, the astrolabe, originally a Greek invention, but one that was greatly improved by Arab sea, tr sea uh, fares and traders uh, within the Islamic realm of trade and and uh, and exchange. This particular astrolabe, made in the Islamic city of Damascus, Syria. Uh, in its own right, a kind of work of art, but also more than that, a practical, valuable navigational tool that Europeans would adapt, along with the magnetic, magnetic compass, adapt from other cultures in their own voyages of exploration. All of this ushering in a new era of global maritime trade, as I say, in the 1400s, particularly as the Portuguese led the European reconnaissance of the ocean. Here you see Lisbon in the very western end of the European continent, the Iberian Peninsula as it's known. The Portuguese voyage is shown here in green, with the green arrows, mostly the near Atlantic Ocean, the African uh, coastal domains, 
and eventually the Indian Ocean. Uh, this becomes the great domain of Portuguese maritime empire building. Others, like the Spanish, uh, initiated by Columbus's 1492 voyage, which you see left Spain, Seville, Spain, uh, harbored in the Canary Islands, a Spanish-Portuguese colony, and then westward across the Atlantic. Uh, Columbus thought he was going to encounter the West Indies, of course, this region here, uh, but because of the limited information, uh, he could not have known that what he would find instead, uh, just about where he expected it. This, this, uh, it's worth saying, I guess, now that the Columbus, unlike the uh, familiar uh, stories from our childhood, was not uh, somehow attempting to prove that the world was round. <laughs> That's an old uh, myth, if you will. Columbus knew, uh, of course, the world was spherical, as did. Uh, the vast majority of educated uh, European uh, merchant traveler seafarers of his day. Uh, it wasn't whether uh, the shape of the world was flat or round, but rather its its true extent. Columbus had estimated what we might call a small earth theory, that is, by sailing roughly 3,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean, that he would actually find Asia. Uh, he did not know and therefore did not calculate on what we call the Western Hemisphere. So he was off by 11,000 miles. But when he reached land, uh, he thought he was in the Indies and thus famously misnamed the native people uh, Indians. Remember, Indies was simply a kind of generic name for the Far East, including the Indian Ocean, India, but also the islands, the Spice Islands of Indonesia. Uh, the Philippine Islands, Japan, China, etc. So he misnamed them Indians. Uh, and, uh, and Columbus would be remembered in history as the discoverer of America. Ironically, he never set, set side on North America. The, the four voyages of Columbus uh, made contact with the islands of the Caribbean, uh, the coastline of Central America, and the northern coasts of South America, but never North America. And yet, despite that, today you see statues to Christopher Columbus in cities across the country, including here in California, in San Francisco, where Coit Tower uh, looms over the city horizon. You see a large uh, statue of Christopher Columbus, uh, just as you do uh, in uh, the town where I live, in Roseville. Uh, there's a statue of Columbus in front of the, uh, the post office. And, uh, and so it raises an interesting question why the, you know, the historical tribute uh, paid to Columbus as a discoverer of America. Well, I think it says more about how the history has been framed by Westerners, uh, by Europeans and Americans alike, particularly by Italian Americans who saw Columbus, of course, as a great son of Italy, a great I Italian hero who could take his place alongside the Anglo heroes, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, etc. And so proud immigrants to America, uh, Italian Americans uh, wanted their native son uh, standing proudly along uh, the rest. Uh, so again, much of that history says more about our own vanities, our own ego, our own heritage uh, projects than it does uh, actual world history. Columbus certainly was an important figure uh, in the expansion of European interest across oceans, but he was one of a number uh, who will comprise the much larger effort of empire building uh, that becomes, in effect, emblematic of a European presence uh, in the New World. Gold, God, and glory, the three Gs, uh, simple to remember, combined uh, to give the Portuguese and Spanish expeditions a militant and military edge. Uh, even Columbus, who sailed in the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, had sewn into the sails of his three ships, the the, uh, the Christian Spanish cross, uh, because it was the emblem of the Crusaders, uh, who for centuries by the time of Columbus had been waging war against the Muslim uh, forces of the Middle East and of Spain and North Africa. Uh, these religious wars, these holy wars, so-called, waged by the Roman Catholic uh, Church, called upon Christians of European residents to take up the cross and to fight 
literally uh, military battles against the so-called infidel, that is the Muslims whom the church had now identified as an enemy. So when Columbus and others begin voyages of exploration, they see themselves very much as crusaders waging a holy war on behalf of their faith and kingdoms. And so, yes, they sewed into their ship's sails uh, the emblematic Christian cross, just as the Christian knights had emblazoned their shields and body armor uh, as well. And so a crusader mentality will carry over into other affairs, uh, economic, for example. Uh, the interests of trade and, and commerce will also come to show the imagery of the Crusades. Uh, this is a, uh, an image of a, a Portuguese gold coin minted from uh, West African gold called the Cruzado. And Cruzado is simply the Portuguese word for crusade. And as you can see here, imprinted right on the coin itself is the Christian cross. So there really was no separation here of what we would call church and state of secular or sacred interests, crusading, uh, religious wars, trade, commerce, exploration, it all blended together uh, for the Europeans. With sometimes predictable and violent results, uh, treating foreign peoples and uh, including native peoples of the Americas uh, as objects of religious war some will come to condemn the violence and corruption embedded in the con so-called conversion process whereby Spanish and Portuguese uh, explorers, adventurers, uh, military uh, people uh, who fronted this, uh, this new age of exploration uh, will seek to employ uh, the power of the Spanish Empire and the Catholic Christian Church uh, to ensure uh, that the foreign lands and the peoples who resided in them would properly fall under now Christian governance. Uh, a Spanish Dominican friar uh, by the name of Bartolome de las Casas will write a famous account called The Brief Account of the Devastation of the Indies, which was a searing criticism written in 1542 of Spanish conquest. Las Casas wrote, the common ways mainly employed by the Spaniards who call themselves Christian and who have gone there to extirpate those pitiful nations and wipe them off the earth is by unjustly waging cruel and bloody wars. Their reason for killing and destroying such an infinite number of souls is that the Christians have an ultimate aim, which is to acquire gold and to swell themselves with riches in a very brief time see the image here, a kind of visual counterpart to Las Casas' written uh, account of Spaniard uh, conquest, shows uh, Spanish soldiers tearing uh, infant uh, and uh, young children away from their mothers who are then hung above a pit of fire uh, to extirpate what was thought to be the sin of, of deviltry and Satanism present uh, in the non-Christian peoples of the New World. It was as if uh, your only choice was to be converted or condemned. And as we know, uh, a great deal of destruction, uh, some would call it genocide, of native cultures in particular uh, followed. A tide of conquest launched across the Atlantic Ocean was often depicted in European accounts as a uh, as an era of discovery. Writers, painters, poets, and travelers often depicted European contact with the Americas as discovery, a kind of benign process, a process of civilizing, of converting, uh, very different from the, uh, the searing account of Las Casas. Uh, the discovery narrative usually showed native people as uncivilized innocents or perhaps savages residing in a wilderness. Here you see a painting uh, by Theodore Galley called America from 1580. It was based on a drawing uh, by the Dutchman Jan van der Straat uh, from a few years earlier. And it depicted the Italian explorer uh, Vespucci uh, confronting America. America here depicted uh, 
as a woman, a naked woman lying on a hammock, uh, seemingly oblivious and innocent to the larger world. Uh, the arrival of Vespucci no, notice here showing the, the instruments of navigation, uh, the technology, the material sophistication, draped in gowns made from fine cloth, carrying a banner with a Christian cross. Vespucci represents, in the European mind, the arrival of civilization in an almost Edenic paradise. Like Adam and Eve, America is depicted as naked, with all manner of, of uh, flora and fauna, from creatures of the trees to creatures of the land, to flowers, uh, to a kind of primitive use of fire you see here in the background. All of this suggested somehow that the arrival uh, and encounter between Western and European uh, hemispheres, uh, that is Western and European peoples, represented a kind of uh, light of civilization arriving in an otherwise uncivilized land. Another painting here, this from the 19th century, a romanticized image of the Spanish explorer de Soto uh, and his encounter in 1541 uh, with the peoples of the Mississippi River. Again, the juxtaposition is, is clear. The light of civilization contrasted with the darkness uh, of America, a darkness that is being brought into light by those who carry the cross. But notice the cross hand in hand with the implements of, of war. Uh, all of which soon to dramatically change the world of the native people who stand rather innocently or even in awe of the Spanish uh, arrival. So a narrative, a way of telling a story that justified uh, the, uh, the presence of Europeans now in a foreign land, uh, a presence that was defined by uh, military conquest, by economic conquest, but depicted somehow in a more benign light to justify. Their contact with native peoples reflected that crusader mentality. Here you see a Spanish account of the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire of Mexico in the early 1500s, the famous Aztec a conquest of the Aztec Empire by the Spanish led by Hernán Cortés, the conquistador, uh, showing a procession of military strength uh, accompanied by native subservience, native uh, uh, porters who carried Spanish goods, uh, leading the way now for uh, Spanish encroachment into the famous Aztec Empire. Compare uh, with, the, with the banners, the Christian banners and Spanish uh, banners uh, emblazoned. Compare that Spanish view of the conquest with a native viewpoint. This, uh, a native codex from the 16th century showing the Spanish arrival, but a very different picture. In this image, native peoples were key allies, not simple servants or porters. But key allies, such as the Tlaxcalan, uh, a people of Mexico who were great enemies of the Aztecs and offered 6,000 warriors in alliance with the Spanish. There was simply no chance that Cortes uh, and his Spanish expedition could have succeeded had they not received critical support from the native people, such as the Tlaxcalan. And notice this native image shows uh, native Mexican people like the Tlaxcalan people right in the thick of the battle uh, with, with, with Native American uh, emblems such as the Quetzal bird which was uh, revered in Native Mexican iconography. Uh, the Spanish in fact appear to be a bit behind the, the front guard and that was true because uh, Cortez's main attack on Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, was was uh, was led by by native allies. All of this combined, of course, with the catastrophic accident of biology. More than Spanish horses, more than Spanish swords, it was European disease, uh, particularly smallpox.
No credible historical evidence exists to indicate that smallpox existed in the Americas before the westward exploration by Europeans, beginning with Columbus. The disease introduced itself to the Caribbean and then the North American and Central American mainland with the arrival of Europeans in 1520 and proved devastating to native populations, as I say, more so than Spanish swords or horses or body armor or gunpowder. The English settlement of the east coast of North America in 1633 was the precursor to devastating outbreaks of smallpox within the Native American population along the Atlantic seaboard. Some estimates indicate that fatality rates reached as high as 80-90% of some Native American populations during the smallpox epidemic. The result of all of this crusading, exploring, trading, and conquering uh, was a new imperial system imposed upon the Western Hemisphere. The expansion of empire from Eurasia now westward across the Atlantic, creating a European colonial land in the heart of the Americas. Expansion into the Atlantic world also fueled was also fueled by the promise of great profit along with God and glory there was gold and not just literally gold but the gold that came from trade that is the profit that came from trade particularly of the great export crop the great, the great cash crop of the European economy in this period a cash crop that was found in the eastern Mediterranean where for centuries it had been developed and marketed by Arab and North African uh, traders and merchants. Uh, not suitable for European climate or soil, it was grown by the Portuguese and then the Spanish here in the Canary Islands, just off the northwest coast of Africa, uh, beginning in the early 1400s. The crop we're talking about, of course, is sugar. Sugar. Sugar cane uh, represented uh, a value worth its weight in gold. So highly prized was sugar as a sweetener, particularly by Europeans, upwardly mobile Europeans in the coastal states of the Mediterranean who were willing to pay a king's ransom. No wonder that the Portuguese came to call sugar engenho. In other words, engine, the engine, the driving engine of the Portuguese maritime economy from the Canary Islands and the busy ports of near Atlantic islands like the Canaries, like Madeira, and later the Azores. This exportable cash crop, worth its weight in gold, required a huge labor force. It was a labor-intensive crop. The process of cultivating, of growing, of cultivating, of harvesting, of processing raw sugar cane into granulated sugar that could be used as sweetener in the teas and coffees and baked goods of Europeans. This will revolutionize not only the economies of Europe but the eating habits of Europeans as well and will, uh, will be the first entry into an entirely new market in labor, uh, an entirely new market in labor that will come to see European people uh, basically enslaving first the native peoples of the Canary Islands uh, and later on bartering for enslaved people uh, of course uh, among the African states. It was the slave markets of West Africa that offered the greatest opportunity now for Portuguese and Spaniards to acquire sufficient labor supplies to uh, to serve the laboring interests of the sugar plantations. In other words, it would be Afro-European connections in the Atlantic world that would create the next great uh, uh, component, if you will, of the growing Atlantic interest. Here you see an ivory mask from Benin, uh, a West African state that features heads representing the Portuguese with whom they traded. And just as we saw in the image the native image of Spanish conquest of the Americas. Uh, West African people would be both victims and partners in the, uh, the rise of an Atlantic world. Uh, 
And in part two of this lecture, we'll come back to look at that relationship between Europeans and Africans that will form the critical next component, the great component in the rise of an Atlantic world and what we'll call the repeopling of the Americas. Far from being exclusively a European story, the rise of colonial empires in the Americas will constitute a three-way partnership between Europeans, Native American people, and African peoples as well. So that concludes part one of our Atlantic World Lecture. We will uh, continue, of course, with part two.